Okay, so uh, shall we begin? Okay. It's up to you guys. <laughs> okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, I guess the song will join us as we begin. Uh, we are we have gathered today to hear a presentation by David Maimon, an associate professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Georgia State University, and of course a research associate at the Federman Cybersecurity Research Center. Uh, today, David will discuss uh, situational, situational awareness and public Wi-Fi users' self-protective behaviors. That was, that was what I was supposed ah, to a, discuss. Now I see a different headline, yeah. So we, so, we have a so surprise. Let, me, have let a surprise. me just be upfront. I mean, if someone, if, if, if you guys are more interested in public Wi-Fi research, <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's time for us to just end this, uh, this, this talk. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll, be, I'll be frank, right? I mean, we simply, we, we have all the data collected uh, about Wi-Fi in Israel, but we simply didn't have time to dive into the database and mm -hmm. analyze it. But so instead, I think, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, I think the research I will present today will be um, as interesting though, right? Because uh, the, the, the research is supported by the Cybersecurity Center, uh, the Federal Cybersecurity Center in Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's focused on smartphone, Israeli smartphone users' behaviors uh, over two months period. And um, more interestingly, I would say um, a week before and a week during a lockdown that was related to COVID. So, you know, I think, I think, I think you will find it really interesting, right? Uh, but again, if you're, if you're here to... Uh, Listen, listen to me talking we, about public Wi-Fi, that will lead. be the case. We will follow your lead. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, what I will talk about today is uh, Israeli smartphone users' susceptibility to cybercrime and present preliminary findings from um, a research, we, uh, a study we conducted in Israel during uh, last year. And if you guys can admit people that will, uh, you know, relieve, <laughs> uh, relieve tension on my end. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, maybe giving a, a, you know, a background with respect to uh, how, how this, this idea um, you know, came from. Um, in 2016, I was a professor at the University of Maryland and uh, was working with uh, a group of scholars in Fraunhofer. Uh, what we did was we submitted, an we submitted a, a grant proposal to NSF um, with the goal to study smartphone users' behaviors here in the United States. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to develop an application, which we have, uh, which is called MedCap, that allowed us to collect information from smartphone users uh, like 24 seven. Uh, something that, you know, I, I assume that now everybody knows that the companies are doing, right? But that, back then in 2016 was uh, I mean, we knew that the companies were doing that, but there was not a whole lot of a discussion around it. So we got the money from NSF. We collected data here in the United States. There were a lot of challenges, finding subjects, uh, as well as running the experiments. We learned a lot. Um, and then I presented the preliminary finding from this uh, research to folks in, in Israel. Um, and uh, Tamar Bernblom, um, thought that it would be a great candidate for getting some funding from uh, the research center. So we put together um, a grant proposal, uh, submitted it, um, and actually got funded. So, you know, uh, we took MedCap, which is the application we developed uh, here in the United States, um, ran a few tweaks, um, and suggested to work with it in the context of uh, Israel. And so the goal of this project. Uh, as we stated in our, in, in our grant proposal, was to identify the social context and personal factors that influence smartphone users' cybercrime victimization in Israel. In other words, what we're trying to do, uh, we were trying to do, and now we're working on um, analyzing the data, we're trying to understand what are some of the uh, places, um, as well as some of the personality traits, time of days, um, in which individuals are more likely to become the victim of cybercrime over their phones. That is essentially what the project uh, is all about. That is um, why we got money uh, from the Cybersecurity Center in Israel um, to do. And what I will do today, in a way, is I'll give you an overview of some of the preliminary findings we have. Um, in fact, and this is something we can discuss later, uh, our first report, which part of it is 
uh, part of it I will discuss uh, in this in this um, in this talk um, will be available for us uh, to upload on your website. It definitely will be on our website next week, right? Um, and it will present some really interesting patterns and trends with respect to how Israeli smartphone users are using their phones. So what I will do today uh, is first give you an overview of smartphone users, smartphone application use in Israel. What are the applications folks are most likely to use? Uh, I, will, I will also give you um, a breakdown um, based on demographic characteristics and application usage. Uh, then we're gonna uh, review some interesting findings with respect to um, smartphone users, smartphone application usage in Israel during the lockdown. Uh, we got lucky in a way, and we were able to collect data from smartphone users' uh, phones uh, during the first week of the third uh, lockdown. So what we were able to do was, uh, we were able to compare how people use their phone during the first week of the lockdown, uh, and a week before. And you know, we'll, we will talk about the result uh, in just a second. And then the last thing I will review is uh, results from the experiment we ran uh, with the 156 respondents we had here, um, which essentially allow us to understand whether security nudges and security, uh, well, security awareness nudges are really effective in improving folks' decision-making with respect to whether to click a link that will make them victim of cybercrime or not. Okay, that is what I will do today. Um, so, uh, you know, the theories and, and everything around that, I mean, we'll talk about in just, sec in just a second, but uh, the, the important thing that you guys need to understand is that once we got the money from the center, we immediately started the recruitment process. Um, what we needed folks to do, and that is, uh, that was a touchy issue here in the United States. It was less sensitive in Israel, I would say, was people allowing us to monitor their smartphone use over a two month period, which was, you know, uh, really challenging. Yeah, so imagine what we were asking people to do, right? We were, at, we're, we're asking you to download an application we developed and allow us to monitor what you're doing on your smartphone for a two months period of time. Of course, you're not doing this for free. We're paying you 400 uh, shekels uh, over the two months period of time. Um, and uh, all, you have to get, all you have to promise is uh, for the application to, to, be, to be on, um, on your smartphone, uh, as well as complete a survey that we wanted you to complete. Okay, so the recruitment process, uh, we posted an ad on the Federal Cybersecurity Center website. We posted ads on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, we tried to recruit from uh, different universities. Um, we also reached out to the Hebrew U staff members, um, you know, faculty, staff, um, and then the last thing we did was because of the fact that we all have extended families in Israel, uh, we posted the ads on our private WhatsApp um, WhatsApp groups. And, and this is how we got uh, people participating in, in the study. So at the end of the day, our final sample uh, included 156 Android smartphone users. And it's, it's important for me to emphasize that we're talking about Android here, we're not talking about iPhones, uh, the application at the moment works only on Androids, okay? Um, the procedures after folks agreed to participate in the, um, in the study, we asked them to complete a survey uh, in which they told us about who they are. Uh, we asked a few theoretical questions. Uh, we asked them questions about the cognitive processes, personality traits, um, you know, all the, all, all the usual stuff, right? That uh, we usually uh, ask during, um, a survey that we conduct in the social sciences. Um, and then at the, the end of the survey, we asked folks to download Madcap, our application, to their smartphone and turn it on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any questions so far? Good. So, and, and I will talk about it in just a second. Uh, once um, folks downloaded the applications, we were able to monitor everything that they were doing on the smartphone. Um, and get a really sensitive information with respect to where they are, um, with respect to sometimes their even uh, sexual tendencies, right? I mean, all you have to do is just look at the uh, applications folks are using, right? Uh, and so a lot of really cool information that you can that we could have uh, gathered, and, and we did gather, you know, things like the type of car they drive. Uh, the type of sound system they have in the house. Everything, everything is on the phone, right? Because your phone essentially records everything. 
And so all this information we're able to uh, collect and then store on our servers. Um, let me give you some interesting descriptive statistics about uh, our, our sample. So, you know, we had a 60%, uh, 60, 40 sort of distribution with respect to um, the, the genders in our sample. Um, our sample is heavily young, um, you know, people between uh, uh, the ages of 22 to 29 were 50%, 55% out of our sample, but we did have a distribution uh, of both uh, young people as well as older individuals. Um, with respect to the level of education, uh, people with high school and BAs were uh, the majority. 67% uh, of our respondents uh, were secular. Um, the majority of our respondents were single. Um, and then the majority of our respondents was uh, income was also uh, below the average um, in Israel. So this is of course information we were able to gather from the survey. And there's a lot of information we can get from the survey and that we still work with. But in terms of demographics, I think this is uh, very important information to present. Now, when you think about all the information we can get and you know, all, the, all, the, all the detail, all the um, uh, potential outcomes we can we can create with uh, the uh, information we collect from the data, um, it's 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 endless. So operationalization of dependent and independent variables is just mind boggling, right? Because um, imagine, Madcap collect information from your smartphone every second. So if you think about it, for every individual in our sample, we have information about how they use their smartphone every second within a period of two months. That's a lot of data, okay? Um, and so we had to figure out a way to sort of use that data in a way that will make sense to social scientists as well as to scientists in general, right? I mean, we have a huge database um, and we have a list of respondents. We're trying to understand their behavior with the smartphone. So we had to come up with some decisions um, which, at this point, we believe are the right decision, but I'm, I'm happy to um, hear what you guys have to say about this. But in the context of this research and the report that um, we will release next week, uh, we decided to go with 10 minutes intervals. So what I will present to you now are essentially the number of applications uh, as well as application, application usage of the 156 subjects we have over 10 minutes intervals throughout the two months period of time, right? So you're getting average, averages of 10 minutes intervals over the two months period of time, okay? Does that make sense? Good. So uh, let's begin with the distribution, right? I mean, the count of applications smartphone user in Israel used over times of days, right? So uh, kind of makes sense uh, during nighttime, uh, especially between one uh, and six, the average application count drops significantly, right? Um, as you guys can see here, between two and six o'clock uh, in the morning, uh, the average application apps over 10 minutes period of time during the two months period is three applications in, in average. Right, and, and hopefully you all understand what we mean, right? I mean, uh, when your phone, when you, when you use your phone, uh, and even you, when you don't use your phone, your application run, the application you used uh, are still running either on the background. And if you're actually interacting with the applications, uh, then of course the application works, right? So uh, what you see here are essentially, uh, I assume the average applications that run in the background, right, during the night. Uh, but as we progress throughout the day, you see that the, the volume of applications, the average number of applications that uh, are open on Israeli smartphone users uh, is around six. So six applications that are open, right? Um, every 10 minutes uh, during, during the uh, experimental period. Um, Another really interesting finding that another really interesting question we're trying to understand is what is the most popular smartphone application used in Israel? I don't know how many of you will find it surprising, but WhatsApp takes it. It's like 47% of the times. So what, what you see here are essentially our count of um, the applications throughout the 
two months period of time during those 10 minutes intervals, right? So in 47% of the uh, counts, WhatsApp was open, right? And people were interacting with it. Then you had Gmail, and then of course, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Google. Um, um, what, we, what we see here, Android is, is the native text messaging app uh, of Android. Uh, here you see uh, the Samsung um, system preferences. I mean, so, so the system uh, procedures, I'm sorry, uh, and then Spotify, and of course, um, other application. In others, you can find really wide range, right, of application, like Waze, like uh, Ynet, uh, it's in Israel, right? Uh, uh, we had, um, uh, of course, people using their cameras, a lot of applications, right? Um, but these are the top seven or, or top eight, I'm sorry, applications uh, that folks were using, right? Uh, can I have a quick question? Sure. Uh, you Did you have the information about the uh, browser habits or, uh, I mean, so so this, it's actually a great question. We, we were not allowed to collect information about the browser habits. Uh, so I, I'm allowed to collect all the information about the application you use, but I'm not allowed to look at the content. Does this make sense? And that's IRB, uh -huh. right? I mean, that's IRB both here in the United States and in Israel. Okay. So I know that you're on the browser, but I don't know where you're going. Okay. I know you're texting. I, I know you're using WhatsApp, but I don't know what, who you're texting with and what, what are you guys talking about? I'm not allowed to collect this data. Yeah. Um, so again, this is the most popular open smartphone application for 10 minutes. Now, we wanted to figure out whether demographic characteristics, uh, whether there are significant differences uh, between smartphone usage um, across different demographic characteristics. The first thing we looked at was age. And uh, what you guys, the way we present it here in, in, in this, in this uh, pie charts is um, we, we present the uh, average Num uh, the average number of application open for each age group, and um, you know the shape of the of the pie chart or the size of the pie chart of this of this slice of the pie chart represent um, the the size of the group, right, uh, in, in the sample. Okay, so when you look at um, the average open smartphone application per ten minutes interval for a different age group. Um, you know, there's, there's really not a whole lot of difference between people between 29 and 29, 22 and 29, uh, 18 and 21, and uh, 40 and 49. Uh, having said that, people between the ages of 30 and 39 seems to use less applications um, during the uh, study period. Um, looking at the level of education, again, not a whole lot of, of, of significant differences there. Uh, six seems to be the, uh, you know, the important numbers, right? Six, six applications were commonly uh, open among the different education, uh, ed education groups in our sample. Um, then we also looked at the distribution of a uh, number of applications open every 10 minutes for uh, different incomes, um, as well as for uh, level of re religiosity. Um, with respect to different level of incomes, uh, we found that those with below average income uh, have one application less than uh, the global average of our sample. As you guys can see, um, you know, the majority of the groups um, open six applications every 10 minutes or have six applications open on their smartphone every 10 minutes, but those below average uh, open only five. Um, Another really interesting difference was uh, observed between folks' level of religiosity. Um, secular folks um, had lower averages with respect to the number of open applications than conservative. So, uh, and we believe, and we actually uh, looked into this, we believe that the extra application here is actually um, you know, th those more religious uh, applications that um, uh, folks use. And, you know, one of my students actually showed me those applications. So, you know, either you have the Bible or, you know, other applications that are, are, that are more associated with um, religious activity. Um, of course, we looked at the difference between male and, and female. 
Um, the difference there was insignificant, okay, with respect to the number of applications that males and females had opened on their phone every 10 minutes. It was, you know, around six per each group. What was interesting, though, is to look at the differences between the different genders across the different age groups we had. As you guys can see in this diagram, um, younger male are more likely to, uh, uh, younger male have higher volume, higher number of application open on their smartphone than uh, younger female. So we see the difference here, 8.6 versus 6.4 applications. Um, we also find that males between the ages of 40 and 49, as well as, be, as, well as uh, over 50, um, have higher, higher number of application open than uh, women ages 40 and 49 and 50 plus. Really interesting stuff, right? I mean, and, and we're trying to figure out why is that the case? Um, another really interesting difference that was, we were able to observe is between um, men and women and their level of education um, and the number of open applications they had on their smartphone. As you guys can see here, um, folks with high school um, diploma, men with, with high school diploma had higher volume of application open on their devices than women uh, with high school diploma. Uh, with respect to professional certificate, um, if you remember the distribution here, I mean, we only have like 4% of the, of the sample um, with professional certificate. I mean, the difference here is huge, but again, there's, there, there are not a whole lot of people with professional certificate, right? So, but again, uh, really interesting difference. Uh, between between these groups, can uh, I interrupt? Sure, this is a good point for you guys to ask <clears throat> questions. Um, I'm, I'm I'm just a technical question. Um, how do you uh, take into consideration the uh, age of the cell phone in relation to the number of apps open? Because if I remember correctly, all phones tend to. Uh, throttle the number of apps and then they close and open sometimes according to the memory usage and not really according to user uh, choice. So Matcap collect all that information as well, right? I mean, so we know the version of the phone, right? We, we, we collect all the information from, from the phone. So we have the version of the phone, um, you know, we, we know when it was first started, right? When, the, when folks first started using the phone. So we, we have all those. Details, we do not control for this here. Okay. So we do not control for this. This I'm presenting to you now, uh, you know, uh, raw data. Okay, but so I'm not standardized cool. based on the phone uh, age. Okay. So okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, uh, these are some of the highlights, right? That we will uh, feature in the report. There, 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 there's really, you know, there are more things that we can discuss, but, um, you know, I really want to uh, move to cover other topics. And the other interesting topic that I think uh, we have is essentially um, Israeli smartphone users before and during lockdown. Um, we collected data last year and, um, you know, the majority of data collection took place between the second and third lockdown uh, in Israel. Um, we got lucky though with 30 participants where um, data collection with them progressed towards the first week of the lockdown as well. So one of the things we wanted to do was uh, we, we wanted to see whether we can compare their smartphone usage, those 30 individual smartphone users a week before and a week during the lockdown. Okay. So these are the sample characteristics of the 30 subjects uh, mm -hmm. to which we had information a week before and a week during the lockdown. Um, again, similar distribution with respect to the genders uh, to that we had in the um, larger sample. Um, we only had uh, people between the ages of 20 and 40 um, in this group. Uh, so 80% of them were between the ages of 22 to 29. Um, 
Similarly to the patterns we observed uh, for the larger sample, uh, the narrow sample uh, had majority of people with either high school or BA, uh, similar distribution with respect to the level of religiosity, um, marital status, as well as income level. So the sample characteristics are, characteristics are, are quite similar other than the fact that um, with respect to age group, we're only we're limited right to the volume. Uh, we're limited to uh, to the age group of 22 to 29 and 30 to 39. Um, let's start with understanding uh, application usage pa patterns a week before uh, and a week during lockdown. Um, what was interesting to us to see was the increase in uh, WhatsApp Messenger usage uh, a week before and a week during lockdown. You see the difference is 48% versus 54%. That is a, a, a difference, right? A significant difference. There were also differences with respect to the applications, uh, like two of the applications that folks were using. Um, the, 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 the major one, the big one is Instagram. So mm -hmm. Instagram during lockdown, uh, we're able to uh, get into the top six App, most used application. Um, well, if you see a week before lockdown, Instagram simply was not there. Um, all the other applications, Gmail, the Android system, uh, the native mess text messaging apps, as well as Google were there. Uh, but Instagram yeah. slipped in, which was really interesting. I mean, my, my assumption, as well as uh, based on my discussion with uh, the students who collected the data, as well as the individuals who helped me analyze the data, people were just taking pictures of foods, right? And, and special dishes, right? That they, they, they were making and uploading them on Instagram. I know, you know, when you're stuck at home, right? You need to do something, right? So you cook, you eat, and, you know, you post on Instagram. Um, then we <clears throat> tried to look for significant differences um, a week before and, and a week during lockdown across uh, the different uh, mm -hmm. age group, as well as between male and female, nothing much going on there, quite consistent. But something that we observed and that was really interesting with respect to um, smartphone, usage, smartphone usage a week before and a week during lockdown was the increase in smartphone usage among married people. This is the week before, this is the week during lockdown, um, as well as the decrease um, in, in smartphone usage among single people before um, and during lockdown. Um, again, what we think, and we are happy to get your thoughts, right, uh, and brainstorm about this together, we think that uh, married people, you know, they had, they had to entertain their kids. Um, so maybe they use their smartphone more to show them Netflix or any of the other applications that folks are using in Israel, maybe they were also more likely to work from home and they were using work-related applications uh, in order to do that. Um, any questions before we move forward to our experiment? Just an anecdote, I think as a parent, uh, I don't know about married, not married, but as a parent, I think one of the reasons we use uh, WhatsApp board during the first weeks is just we had to supplement communication with the outside world. Yeah. And we were, we were totally lost with our children and needed some help maintaining our sanity. And uh, WhatsApp <laughs> was one of the best ways to do that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm telling you, I have two kids. The, the young one, he's, you know, that's the, that's the best way to calm him down. No, but Dudi, I have a, I have a question about uh, when you're locked at home and you have uh, alternative platforms, okay, which you can log in. You can use your computer, you can use your uh, iPad, and you can use your phone. And I'm wondering whether this is not part of the explanation. I mean, when you're at home, you're more likely to use your computer, for instance, to Google things maybe than your phone, no? So to tell you the truth, I mean, if, if you, it, it depends, right? I mean, so, so there, there are two ways I can answer this question. First, uh, not all families, and if you think about our samples, uh, our sample is heavily composed out of people with a uh, uh, level of income less than the average. Okay, so they may be more limited with respect to the technical devices they have in, in, their, in their home, right? So maybe that's why you see an increase, right? Um, 
and, it, and maybe also if I can jump in sure. maybe also if we had more people at the home at the house so maybe others were using exactly. better devices like kids going to, to school via zoom and, and, and other uses and then no. left the parents just with the phone could be I, I think statistics shows that people use their phone more than their computers even at home and that's the other explanation. No, I think uh, Google, when they advertise for their advertisement, they uh, they say this. So, so that is the other I was intrigued why why you have uh, why you have a rise with WhatsApp and a decrease with Google. Uh, it's not it's so one has to um, so, right the ones. No, so actually, the, it was almost it was almost yeah, the same, right? Exactly. So, so the we, decrease was not. Yeah. The decrease so Gmail, not, Gmail. So maybe yeah. uh, checking emails. Maybe you yeah. do that on another. Are ah, you ah, okay? So it's also up. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I have Gmail, to think more about this. Yeah. Again, the Instagram to me is is really. I mean, if you look at the percentages of Gmail, uh, you know, we were looking at what 0.6 versus 0.1. It's it's not a whole lot, right? I mean, it's it's insignificant. But what's significant is the fact that Instagram slipped in here. Because Instagram uh, is also a business tool. So many people who started working from home, advertising from home. So exactly. Or just escapism. I mean, it's classic for world crisis. Could be. But, but again, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that, right? I mean, because, you know, uh, we, we collect data live, right? Like every, every 10 minutes or 20 minutes, we upload the data from the folks' smartphone to our server. And, and you see, you know, what folks are using. Um, so... Again, Instagram was really interesting in the sense uh, to, to observe sort of more traffic, right, from, from this um, uh, platform um, during lockdown. Again, it's interesting. I'm not familiar with any other study around the globe that we can compare this data to. Um, but, you know, I think it'll be really interesting in the report to discuss. And hopefully next week we'll be able to put it on our websites uh, and then we're going to get some attention. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. The report is ready. And we wanted to launch the report two weeks ago, but because of you know circumstances in Israel, right, uh, we decided to postpone, right. So uh, we're going to go live with this next week. Um, do, do they have you tracked like medical apps? I mean, there was uh, this uh, I'm again thing that was, uh, but it's, it didn't make the top five six during lockdown. Not, not here, but we can. So so imagine we have everything you can like everything folks had on their phone. We have. I'm, I'm more than happy to go back and and. Uh, try to you know, get some information about this as well um but but it's it's a huge database it's a huge database and we had to come up with some decision that would allow us to present the data in a in a coherent way um in a way that will you know not overburden the audience so um any other thoughts before we move on to the actual experiment yeah, um, can you say something about the uh, selection bias or, or how representative is this uh, uh, survey, right? You have uh, 189 participants who are not, uh, who do not follow, right, the characteristics of the general population. The vast majority are probably students who do not work. Um, or, or, and I, I think that this might explain at least uh, to some extent the difference in the app that they use, uh, right? The difference between the 30 to 39 and the 22 to 29, right? The 30 to 39 are probably at work, so they don't open all of these apps. And those are the 22 to 29 are those who do not listen to, our, to us when we teach and uh, sir, use their phones. Um, so, so how. To what extent can we learn from this study about the general Israeli population? It's, it's a great question, right? I mean, um, I don't think you can generalize to the entire population because you don't have, we don't have uh, Haredim and we don't have, a, I, don't, I don't think we have a Aravim program. Um, as, I'm, I'm, uh, sample, you know, it couldn't be generalized, right? Uh, to the entire Israeli population. Having said that, it's a way better sample in my mind uh, than simply having a student-based sample, which you know many many scholars still use, right? I mean, administer a survey among their MA or, or BA students, and then they write papers around this, right? Um, because at the end of the day, we did reach out to people outside of universities, and you know, you see, we have five uh, percent. I mean, fifteen percent. Um, or, or a little more uh, of, of our sample, right, uh, are over 40, 
right? And then you have also people between the ages of 18 and 21. So you, you're right in the sense that you have a large sort of population of people between the ages of 20 and 29, uh, but you, you do have a representation, right, uh, from, from the other age groups. Um, again, I agree with you. You can't take this and say this is generalized to the whole uh, Israeli population because we don't have Haredim here. We don't have um, uh, Aravim. Uh, but, you know, it gives you, I think, uh, a, a, a good understanding with respect to um, what the majority of Jewish uh, Jewish citizens, right, in Israel uh, were doing during those two months period of time. Maybe just one more uh, question about it, right? So if, if you would ask me if I will give you two months access to my phone, I would say definitely not. Even though I don't use much, right, secret apps and stuff. But uh, so again, how would you characterize those who agree to participate? What was the response, right? How many people uh, right, refused to, to participate uh, in, in, the, in the study? Uh, and, and, and in this sense, would you think that it's better than just to have like a general survey, mm -hmm. ask people, right? To what extent do you use this app or that app for, for the duration of time? Would, would, would you think that the, the results would be uh, much different or, or right? If, if you ask me uh, how much do I use uh, WhatsApp in a day, right? It won't be exactly accurate, but I will have no problem to, to share the information with you. I don't think you will know though. I don't think you'll be, I mean, and we, we you know, in terms of, so, so maybe I should start with the first question. You're right in the sense, and if you look at the income, if you look at the income distribution, You'll see that we're heavily skewed. We're heavily skewed towards individuals with less than average income. Okay, the incentive we provided was 400 shekels. Um, you know, it, it was it, it's good money, right? Um, for for what? For me sitting on your phone, I don't know what you're doing in the sense of who you're talking to. I don't know what you're doing. I don't, I don't know what you're doing in the sense of what you're consuming, what you're buying. All I know is that you're using specific application. Now, whether that has an issue with, um, with, with, with you allowing access to your phone, maybe, and, and definitely that's the case. Um, I, I, I have to tell you this, we were able to recruit more people in Israel than we were in the United States. In the United States, I had a hard time finding people who will agree for me to monitor their smartphones. But in Israel, it was fairly easy. I was able to uh, finish the sample recruitment within a month. Um, in the United States, it took me a whole year to get a sample of 86 people, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I mean, our, our sample is definitely skewed towards individuals with uh, less than average income, uh, individuals who maybe are younger, but it, it's still, I mean, it gives you some sense with respect to what those individuals did, right? Um, um, you know, during those two months period of time. And I should say also that it's way better than what we have and that we and, and what we know already. I mean, there's no research that is similar to what I'm presenting to you right now. Like no one, no one else has this kind of data. Um, so although the data is not perfect, you can still learn something from it. Again, I'm not claiming here that this is a nature article. Um, but you know, it's 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 an interesting article. It's an interesting report that teaches something about the Israeli population and how they use, or or a portion of the Israeli population and how they use uh, their smartphone. Um, but your point is 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 uh, uh, very is of course is, is valid and, and I accept it. Did it answer your question? <clears throat> Okay, great. Um, so so uh, we still have a few minutes left. Um, and so what I want to do is actually now, so, so this is all, um, at least in my mind, the, the uh, appetizer, right, to the main dish, right? Because uh, when we started this uh, research, we weren't really into uh, collecting statistics about individuals and what do they do and how do they use their smartphone. We wanted to understand uh, how these guys open themselves to different types of cybercrime. This is where we got the money from. Um, the center. Um, 
So, so the report, as I indicated, that uh, I hope will go live next week. Uh, we, we can talk whether you guys want to have it on your platform as well. We're definitely going to have it on, on my uh, website, uh, but maybe we can you know, try and market it and get some uh, public attention to it. I think it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> but again, <clears throat> our goal was to really understand some of the social factors, um, some of the situational factors, and some of the personality traits that will essentially expose people to become the victim of, of cybercrime on their smartphone. And, you know, we had a range of dependent variables in this sense, uh, but the one we focus on in this experiment and I will, I will talk about uh, today is smishing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this concept of smishing. Smishing is like phishing just over your smartphone, right? I mean, so you get a text message from someone telling you you've won $5,000, right? Uh, click on the link, we'll send you the money to your bank account. You click on the link, boom, you get malware, right? Um, uh, so, so this is this is smishing, and so we're trying to understand um, in this specific, specific uh, uh, study. Uh, and again, we have a lot of data, and we're going to take it to so many direction with other dependent variables we have. But in this specific study, we're trying to understand some of the cognitive traits, um, as well as <clears throat> uh, you know the social factors that uh, contributes to folks' susceptibility to actually click on a smishing text and then. Uh, having their smartphone being taken over by a malicious actor. Um, so, so the thing we were interested most about, uh, and, and we sort of generated a lot of work, was um, all the cybersecurity awareness training uh, that are out there. I don't know if, I mean, I, I'm, it, it has been a while since I visited Israel, but at least here in the United States, the cybersecurity awareness training, oh my gosh, it's just, it's a nightmare. I mean, everybody has to go through them. You, you can't have access to your university account unless you go through this stupid training which no one really look at i don't know if you guys look at those trainings uh and, and actually consume some of the material i just go through them and um but still i mean they're very important there's a lot of uh interest scientific interest as well as uh policy relevant interest about the effectiveness of those awareness program programs um we were really interested in trying to figure out whether uh those programs or a specific program uh, is effective. And, and in this sense, um, we focused on security nudges that folks got on their phones. Um, essentially, we were interested whether you will be more or less likely to click on a smishing text if we send you throughout the experimental period security nudges telling you you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you're gonna make sure you need to make sure that you have uh, malicious software on your, uh, on your smartphone, and so on and so forth. Um, so that was one of the things that we were interested in and, and interested in exploring their effect on the probability of clicking on a, on a smishing text. Uh, we we're also interested though in the cognitive processes that um, at the end of the day we know are important for determining folks' victimization. Uh, the specific cognitive process we focused on is a construct that was coined, was sort of constructed by Pat Anastasia and Pogarski, two criminologists who came up with the concept of TRDM, thoughtfully reflective decision making. According to these guys, we all differ, right, uh, in the way, in, in our ability to make good decisions. Some of us are better than others in making good decisions. So TRDM um, essentially is composed out of folks' ability to recognize alternatives to different decisions we make gather information, think and wait alternative, and then evaluate the alternatives and make a choice, right? Before we make a choice. Some of us are better doing all these things uh, while other, uh, you know, are worse, uh, are worse in doing this. So, so we're really interested in trying to figure out whether uh, this cognitive process conditioned the effect of the nudges on folks' probabilities to become a victim of Smishing, right? I mean, so the, the TRDM is a concept that at the end of the day, Paternoster and Pogorsky tied empirically, of course, with deviance and crime, right? They, they suggested that if you're high on TRDM, if you're, uh, if you know how to make decisions in an appropriate way, good decisions, then you're less likely to get involved in deviance and crime. You're less likely to be obese. Um, you, you, you're more likely, you're, you're less likely to become a victim of crime. And so we're using this rationale and trying to figure out whether that will work also uh, in the context of cyberspace and in conditioning the effect of security nudges.
Okay, so the two research hypotheses we have here are first security nudges. You get, you know, you get, you get tips from me, right? Uh, how to reduce the probability of smishing victimization that will be effective in reducing your smishing victimization. That's the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that if you have high level of TRDM, um, the nudges will work better. That's essentially what we're saying, right? I mean, so, so you know, it will enhance the effect of uh, security nudges in reducing the probability of smishing victimization. So to, to test this, um, once folks enrolled into uh, our study, we randomly assigned them to control and treatment group, okay? Uh, the control group, you know, we didn't do much with them, which is monitor your smartphone. The treatment group, on the other hand, receive on a weekly basis nudges from us to their smartphone on the form of a text message. Okay, uh, this is one of the nudges. This is another nudge, right? But over a period of six weeks, folks got from us a nudge, security nudge, um, with explanations, right, of how, how to behave securely uh, in cyberspace. Then after the six, uh, six weeks period, we sent a smishing attack, right? You know, to try and assess whether the security nudges, um, I mean, it, it, well, security nudges are really effective as well as train people and make people aware of the smishing issue. Um, and then after the first attack, which was essentially a training attack, we launched the real attack, sort of speaking, um, with this message suggesting that Bank Israel because of the all banks, you know, please, the attention of the bank of your bank in the next Okay. And so, what we're trying to understand is whether the nudges really had any effect in preventing smishing, and whether the level of TRDM conditions the effect. What we found. And I'm not going to give you the numbers, right? Because I'm, I'm not sure you guys are interested in the numbers. I'm more than happy to share the numbers and we're working on a paper uh, that we'll send out soon. Uh, the nudges weren't really effective. Okay, so getting a security nudge every week from us about the appropriate secure ways to use your smartphone didn't really uh, affect folks' probability to click on the smishing link. However, if you had high level of TRDM, and you received the security nudges, Oop. Um, it actually worked, right? So the security nudges actually worked, right? Um, on your probability. So they reduced the probability of you actually clicking on the smishing link. So, you know, hopefully that makes sense, right? So the security nudges work for individuals who are high with their cognitive traits, right? So if you have high level of cognitive traits, high level of TRDM, um, the nudges will work and will use your probability to click on the link. Go ahead. How did you measure the level of uh, decision making of each participant? So we use, so again, we had a survey, right? And I, I should have mentioned that we had a survey uh, at the beginning. Uh, and I think I mentioned it at the beginning of the- You mentioned that there was a survey, but I understood it was yeah. a technical one or an essential one. No, so you have you have a demographic. So at the beginning of the, of the uh, study, folks were asked to complete a full survey, right? Uh, telling us about the demographic traits as well as their personality traits. So, you know, in the context of TRDM, we used the four items that uh, Pogarski and, and um, Pat and Oster, um advocated for, um, as, as well as the same coding. So, you know- you But it was the self-perception of each participant. So you- Yeah. You, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, so you take this and you simply correlate it mm -hmm. with, um, the nudges, right? Which again is really interesting, right? Because at the end of the day, we see that the security nudges, you know, we spend a lot of money on security nudges and training and all that. But at the end of the day, at least this study shows that they only work for individuals who make decisions, right? Uh, uh, in, a, in an appropriate way, right? Uh, in a good way. So to summarize everything I was discussing here today, um, then you know we can open it to a discussion if you want. WhatsApp is the most common used application used by Israeli smartphone users. Young and older men use their smartphone application more than their female counterparts. Married smartphone users use their smartphone more during the third COVID-19 related lockdown than before the lockdown, while single people used it less. 
And then finally, security nudges reduce the probability of high TRDM individuals to become victim of uh, smishing. And with that in mind, uh, I mean, I am supposed to talk to you about, uh, you know, you guys paid a lot of money for this uh, research, so I, I better come up with uh, more results, right? I see you Val there. You know, uh, so so we we we're bringing in more psychological traits and and more cognitive traits that we asked and and try to tie this with both uh, smishing and as well as other types of uh, cybercrime optimizations. We are trying to understand based on the really cool information we're able to collect from folks' smartphones um, how different application use open you to different types of attacks, right? Uh, as well as related to your decision-making process. This is, you know, more work There's the database is huge. And if any one of you wants access and want to work with us on this, I'm more than happy, um, you know, to allow access at the end of the day, it's your property. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, David. Uh, so we does anyone have any more questions he wants to raise? Feel free to bark in. Yali? Yeah, uh, ju just maybe, maybe a couple of questions. The, the first is, um, I'm just curious, how many participants actually uh, filled out their uh, bank details when you sent them the text? It's a, you know, it's a good question. Um, how many people fell victim, you mean, mm -hmm. to the... To the to the, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to go back to, uh, you know what, I can, I can run this right now. Uh, I can't really remember, but I'll give you this number right now. And, and I apologize, I should have, I should have been- oh, uh, Maybe we need to change our uh, career path. If, if many people fell victims, maybe it's, it's you know? So if 30%, 30% of the sample, fell victim to uh, this mission. So we're talking about 45 people out of the 156. Which is this, is this in line with your expectations or is it uh, more or less? I, I think that maybe it's in line with my question about uh, selection bias because those who, who agreed to participate in your experiment are those who are less afraid from intrusion into their privacy. Maybe they're more naive, more, uh, right? Uh, they trust people more. I, I, I'm not sure uh, to what extent is it actually true, but I think that it, it, it's a reasonable assumption about those who agreed to participate in the, in the experiment. And, and my second question was, um, what, are there any differences between uh, your results from the United States and, and your results in Israel, or did you check completely different things? There isn't. Um... So, so there's, in fact, in the United States, the sample we had, way more people actually fell victim to this. Um, you know, we're talking about 50% of the sample here in the United States. Um, again, it took me a while to recruit this sample. So, you know, I'm less confident that uh, this, is, this is a true representation of what we have here. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of comparison of the two samples, uh, the Israeli sample, um, folks are doing better, I guess, in Israel than in the United States. But again, I'm saying this with cautious, given the samples I have, so. What, what's the policy implications of this, uh, Dudi, for going forward in terms of uh, Raising aware, so, raising well, it's not the paper on situational awareness, but how do you go about uh, raising awareness uh, if uh, uh, if if nudges didn't? Uh, I mean, for a large number of people, nudges do not help at all. So, so that's the thing, right? I mean, uh, it's 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 really interesting. It's a very good question, right? Um, in my mind, uh, and and this is this is my agenda. This is what I've been working on throughout my career, right? Um, and, and it started when I was working as a like hardcore traditional criminologist who was interested in violent behavior. We know that TRDM uh, is important in determining your engagement in violent, violent crime for, for adolescents and youth. So we had, we actually published on this in 2012. But we also know that as a kid, if you go to school, if you go to a school where sanctions um, are fairly severe, 
for your engagement in either violent crime or property offending, it, it, it actually disarm the impact of TRDM on your involvement in crime. So social context sort of take away the impact of your TRDM, right, of, of your personal trait from the equation and, and impact your involvement in crime. When you think about it in the context of this study and other studies we conducted with phishing experiment running in the Hebrew U that maybe some of you became victim on uh, during the last couple of years, we, we, we see it's the same thing, right? I mean, context definitely play a role, as you can see here from, from um, the research in conditioning the effect of TRDM. So in my mind, if you think about policy, you can take it to two directions. Either you tailor policies that could focus or, or, or could target people with high level of TRDM, high level of cognitive processes and different policies to people with, you know, lower level of TRDM, that's one thing, or the alternative, and this is where you get into the big brother, dystopian, whatever, you design social contexts that disarm the effect of TRDM on behavior. Now, you know, once you, and, and this is essentially what nudges are, are all about, right? I mean, uh, once you introduce people into social context that at the end of the day will push them to do whatever you want, um, you know, is, is, is one of the way to go in the context of policy. So um, either way would work. And, and again, we can get into discussion here, what is better for our society. Uh, um, but, you know, these are the two policies I see from this. Does this answer your question? I see, I see uh, Daphna raising Daphna, Daphna has a question, yeah. Um, thanks. Um, I, I have two questions. I mean, do you assume that there is a connection or what's your assumption on the connection between the kind of apps that people are using and the effect or the chance for this user to become um, a, a victim of cybercrime? What I mean is that maybe in certain apps are has kind of a role in raising awareness to this. Um, just, I'm curious to hear uh, what you think about it. And, um, and also if, if you think that according to those, to this, to the, to the um, data that you gathered, um, you know, if you, if you think that we can draw from there, um, 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 more of a, a pattern, um, I mean, from your knowledge on, on, on cyber crime and how, and how predators are, are operating, how do they work? Do you think that if there is something in this data that you can see um, that fits to, to, um, to familiar patterns of, of predators? So, so it's, it's, it's again, great, great question. Um, so, so with respect to the, the applications, one of the interesting things um, in the context of this research is that once you understand the most commonly used application, in a way, if, if an offender had this kind of data, he would have been able to contemplate their attacks in a more efficient way, right? Because essentially when I present to you this figure, I'm telling you, um, where is it? Right here. I'm telling you what is the most common vector of attack that you can use in order to target individuals. So based on this, I tell you, I can send you a smishing text, not, not on your, not on your uh, native Android text message app, but on WhatsApp. That will increase your probability, right? To, to actually click on the, link, on the link because you're always on, on, star, on, always on WhatsApp, right? So I assume that had I had to go back, right? And rerun the experiment, I wouldn't have sent the smishing text over the, Android native text messaging app. I would have sent it over the WhatsApp and I assume that I would have gotten a way higher victimization right there, right? So this is, this is for your, uh, I, think, I, think it, I think it will answer uh, your, your first question. And, and, and Gmail in this sense, Instagram, Twitter, these are all platforms that we spend a lot of time on. And once I know you spend a lot of time on this platform, I can try and victimize you through those platforms. Right? I can send you an email over Gmail Simply try to spearfish you, you know, uh, all, all those different platforms, and then and then get your details, get whatever I need from you, quicker. Does that answer your, the first part of the question? 
Yes, because you think that people trust the certain platforms more so that if, if it would come from there, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's not only trust. I mean, you're there, right? And, and one of the theories we use in criminology called routine activities theory, which essentially suggests that, you know, the more time um, you're in a yeah. place, for, you know, you bring together uh, target, offenders, okay. lack of supervision, right? I mean, so this is just, you know, one of the things that um, you see in this graph, just in an online environment. Now, with respect to the second uh, um, part of the questions, uh, with respect to criminal patterns, I don't, you know, from what I see here and from what we have in the database, um, I can't really deduce any criminal patterns, right, uh, that folks are involved in. Because again, I don't see the content um, of the information that folks are sort of using uh, or, or running through those applications. So, um, so I'm afraid I can't really answer the second, uh, the second part of the question with respect to patterns uh, we can observe. But to follow up on that point, uh, David, even if not to recognize a pattern, maybe there are some warnings or steps that can be taken as a result of- Of course. Uh, and, and of course. And, and so based on what you see here in front of you, I mean, you can, you can definitely alert the public that, I mean, if someone wants to victimize them, all they have to do is send a smishing text on WhatsApp, and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't have any statistical data, but I can speak from the, the experience of my phone. I know that the, all of the spam smishing messages I get are only from regular text message. I, I never got one. You see? WhatsApp. So had I sent you a text over... <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. I mean, if I had, if I had to go back in time, based on what I know now, I would have tried and victimized you through WhatsApp. through WhatsApp. And I think I would have gotten many more people. So right now we, we were talking about 30%, right? I, I would have, I, I mean, this is maybe, you know, maybe Uvali can give me more money to, uh, to do that in Israel, right? <laughs> no, huh? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're muted, Yuval. Yeah, I mean, our bank account is a bit low for the center. I know, I know. But, I know. Uh, but, but I mean, <laughs> No, we get, a, we get, I mean, all the time we get uh, through WhatsApp, I mean, surveys, I mean, whenever you, uh, I mean, I think you have it quite a lot, no? I usually receive them in regular text messages. I think that in WhatsApp, the, the photo factor gives confidence to people. And I guess that it's also an inhib inhibition if someone wants to mm. uh, try and promote any malicious actions. I, I was wondering also, David, how, how do you how do you intend to treat uh, the iPhone mar market? So we we so any... it's it's a great question. I mean, we definitely you know folks uh, talked about selection bias. Another selection bias is the fact mm -hmm. that we're on Android only, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're working on developing the the application for iPhone. The the, the thing with iPhone, and I don't know if I mean, maybe you don't experience it in Israel. Uh, it's it's very difficult to get an application on their their um, their store. With Google, I mean, you can just and this is how actually you get a lot of malware, right? Uh, on Android, I mean, you just upload the application and then you there's there's really no vetting, so folks can download any application you develop. With iPhone, you know, Apple is more stringent uh, with uh, the way you know they allow the applications on their store. So there's a challenge there. And uh, you know, if we have enough money and time, then maybe we can do that. But that definitely is something we need to do here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Maybe iPhone is uh, promoting any call for uh, research on the topic. Maybe you can yeah, uh, maybe. get your approval yeah. and your money together. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I think what's interesting again is the fact that, uh, and I'm not familiar with any research like this, mm -hmm. um, and it's a good thing, right? Because it can help us in the future get more money to. Mm -hmm answer all the questions you, you're asking, right? And I, and I don't have any answer mm -hmm. at this Wonderful. point. Brilliant. Any other uh, questions, comments? Excellent. So uh, David, I wish to thank you on behalf of everyone. It was very interesting and very thought provoking. And once once the report will be out, definitely we'll be we'll be glad to help and promote it and publish it. Definitely. Yeah, I think I think it will be a really interesting report to maybe uh, push uh, in Israel and, and get some media attention to. Uh, mm -hmm. I will send you the report. I mean, it will be next week. Maybe, um, maybe we can even 
try and publish a, an op-ed on the topic. I think that it will be interesting. I, I think it will be great. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. And so yeah. we have uh, your students actually working on that. Eden Zeitner from uh, the mm -hmm. Criminological Institute. And uh, we have several students from here working with me on this. But uh, we prepared the report in order for you guys to push um, and get some attention in Israel. That's for sure. Wonderful. Super. Okay. So thank you very much, David. Okay. Thank you a lot. Thank you, guys. Take care. <laughs> See you. Bye, Nikos.